So, as they're beginning to clear out, I just want to say, um, as I was praying about tonight, um, the Lord gave me a word of knowledge, but I had time to actually just look at it and pray over it, and I just want to share it with you tonight. It's a word of encouragement for these Wednesday nights that we're doing, okay? And the word is this. It's in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Now, chastening here is to instruct. Now, I know that we are all people that sometimes we just, we hate to break the routine. We hate to learn new things sometimes, especially when it, sometimes it feels like it's forced on us. But I want to say this. I do construction. I do woodworking. I like to do all that stuff, okay? And sometimes if I'm working on my house, there's a tool that I need, but I'm only going to use it one time. We just ran into this recently working over at Kevin's. We, we got a tool, and we just needed to use it one time. I said, we can just go to the church and get one. And Kevin said, no, I want to be able to have this tool, so if I ever need it again in the future, I'll have it. Now, I want to let you guys know something tonight. All this stuff right now that we're learning about leadership might not be applicable to you in this time or season of your life. But I want to let you know that sometime down the road, you're going to need it. And instead of not having the tools and being equipped to do what you need to do and have the knowledge that you need to get through these things... You would have to call on somebody else that had more knowledge than you about leadership. Or you just wouldn't know what to do and you had to go to the Lord. But when we go through here and you are actually focusing and studying and learning, you might not think that you're learning much. But I guarantee you that in the time when you need it, the Holy Spirit is going to bring that word back to your memory. And you're going to have that tool that you need for that time in your life or that job that you're doing. Just like me, Kevin might need that tool later on down the road to do something else. There's always something that pops up, or maybe somebody needs to borrow it, like me. So there's always room for growth in the body of Christ. And I've been learning, as I, uh, lately I've just been hungry, and I've been desiring to grow. And just, I just want more of God, and I want everything that he has for me. Can, is that all you guys agree with me? If you agree with me, wave, wave your hand. Come on. Come on, wave your hand. Amen? Amen. All right. Praise God. So, tonight, I just thank God that I am able to to do character when it comes to leadership because I come from a background where my whole family had horrible character. I had horrible character and my character's not perfect right now, but it sure is growing. When I, I work construction, and I can tell you right now, the construction people have probably the worst character in the world because if you drink the night before and you have a hangover, you're just not gonna go to work the next day. You're gonna call in and I remember some guys, sometimes their grandma died like five times in a year. I mean, construction's just like that. It's, I mean, no character at all. They come in and do the minimum, and when they come in, the work is sloppy, and it's just, it's just not done right. And I, I lived like that, and I grew up like that. And that's what I did, because that was the way I was taught, and I, I learned. But I want to let you guys know something. Character is worked in. Character doesn't happen overnight. We're not born with character. Some people are born to be pretty good leaders, but still... Character. Um, I remember, I, I believe it was Pastor Dave recently that told me this. He said, your gifts will bring you in front of, front of kings, but your character will keep you there. Because we all have gifts from God. But only your character can keep you there. Because if you go up there and you use one of your gifts for something, and you know, that's, that's good. And the king's like, oh yeah, we can use that. But then you have horrible character, and the next time they need you to do something... You say, I'll be here at this time, and you, he has everybody there, and they're all waiting, and you don't show up until an hour later and act like it's not a big deal? That's bad character. How about if you show up to work, and you don't have everything done that you need to do from the night before? Let's say um, I used my hammer over the weekend, and I needed my hammer and I used it over at my friend's house, and I forgot and left it over there. And the night before, I didn't go and look and see all the tools that I needed because I didn't really care that much. And I didn't have my hammer. So the next day when I went to work, I didn't have a hammer. Because I didn't prepare the night before. And everybody had to wait for me to ask somebody if I could use the hammer. It's really bad to have people wait for you. 
especially if you're a leader. Nobody should have to wait for you. You should be there and be the first one there and be ready to go. Amen? Amen. So, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27 says this, But I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, least when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. We will never, ever have character without self-discipline. Self-discipline is what's going to get your character to where it needs to be. Because a lot of times you don't want to get up and go to work, especially if you worked really hard the night before and you're sore and you're tired. And you're like, I just don't want to get up and go to work. I feel so tired. But that self-discipline, when you're crucifying that flesh and you're saying you're going to get up and go anyway, buddy, that's where character comes in. That's when character is built in those tough times. I, sometimes I say character is built in the fires of hell because, man, I remember coming up, some things was hard, but it was necessary to build my character. So if it's hard, if these seem hard, it seems like it's hard to receive and pertain. I just pray tonight that the Lord and the Holy Spirit would help you to receive them in the way that you can understand. But I just want to encourage you, it's not easy. And it's not supposed to be. Because if it was easy, we wouldn't have character developed in us. So then when the devil attacked or something got hard, we wouldn't have to do it. We wouldn't know what to do. You know what? I'm gonna, I know Pastor Dave's not going to like this, but I'm going to brag on him. I've talked to him because he's been mentoring me. And he said sometimes he's been so sick or his back's been so bad that he could barely stand up here and preach. This was in the past. But he knew that he didn't have nobody else that day to preach. So he got up out of bed and he said he would just come up here and he'd have to hold on to the pulpit just to get some relief. But he would still preach. And usually when the anointing kicks in, it starts feeling a little bit better, but after the anointing leaves, it Comes right back. I've been like that before. Or having headaches so bad that he could barely see. But yet still preaching and finishing the message. That's character. That's character. And it shouldn't just be up here at the pulpit. There's too many people out in this world that think they give Christians a bad name. And you know why? Because somebody will go up and say, oh, I'm just going to use my God card. And when I go to get this job, I'm going to say, yeah, I'm a Christian and all this stuff. But yet they have bad character. They show up late, and they do all these things because they thought, well, if I use my God card, maybe I get some brownie points. But what they do is they turn around, and they make other Christians look bad because their character's not developed yet either. And just like people that would go, and I've heard before that um, Christians would go, and instead of leaving a tip for a waiter at a um, place to eat, they leave a track. Why don't you leave a tip and a track? Then maybe they'll read it. Because, and then what if you go back to that restaurant and they're going to be like, I don't want to go over and wait on them. And they're going to talk to all the other people, all the other waiters over there in the corner, all over there looking at you, talking. Nobody wants to come wait on you because you tip with tracks instead of money. It's the goodness of God that brings people to repentance. So why don't you share some of that goodness that God shared with you and give them money and a track. And then maybe next time when you go in there, they'll listen to you. If you don't have good character and you're like that with people who work under you, they're not going to want to listen to you. They're not. I had a boss that was like that. Man, I can tell you guys some stories. Oh, praise the Lord. So, character. We're going to start on page 61. Right at the very top. What is the most difficult task any leader ever faces? Without a doubt, it is leading ourselves. It is a difficult task we must face every day. It's much easier to tell others what to do than to do it ourselves. I know that's true of me. That's another thing. Um, I would never ever, myself personally, I would never ever tell somebody to do something that I wouldn't do or I have not already done. That's just wrong. I think that's wrong. I've either did it before or I'm going to do it. That's just the way it is. We should never ever expect somebody to do something that we wouldn't do ourselves. To keep myself on track, I must continually remind myself why character is so important. Now, just take a moment here and pause and think about why character could be so important. Because 
Character and leadership. Not just needing it in leadership. We need it just to live a good Christian life. Character is a foundation of being a good Christian. If you don't have character, people can't depend on you. And they can't depend on you as a person. Then, I'm not saying this in a bad way, but what good are you? Because nobody's ever going to want to listen to you. Nobody's ever going to want to come alongside you and help. Because you're not demonstrating and displaying characteristics of a good person yourself. And it goes on to say, And I have to examine my thinking, motives, and actions. Page 62 at the bottom. Just got this one line here. Working on my character is a never-ending, yet totally worthwhile effort. 63. At the very top, I want to be a worthy leader, yet I know I sometimes fall short. I want to improve my character and encourage you to improve yours. Not because it gets me what I want, but because it helps me to be what I want. And I find that the more I focus on valuing people, practicing self-leadership, and embracing good values, the stronger my character becomes. You know... When it comes to building our character and building our leadership skills, we have to be intentional about it. It's not something that comes natural. We have to put forth effort and focus on it. Amen? Amen. Character value statements. Having good character does not ensure that you will be successful in life or leadership. But you can be sure that having poor character will eventually Derail you personally and professionally. I'm going down just a little bit. Here are three great reasons why good character is worth pursuing. Number one, good character builds strong trust. Recently, I asked a small group of executives to list the names of the top three people they trusted. Family and friends were on everyone's list. Amazingly, no one named a leader or a coworker as one of their top trusted people. I then asked them to list three people of whom their well-being and happiness depended. Everyone named either their boss or a coworker. I then asked one more question. If I were doing this exercise with your subordinates and I asked them to create their most trusted list, would they name you as one of their three most trusted people? There was a murmur, and that got their attention. What difference might it make if you were someone they put on their list? The consensus was that if people trusted their co-workers and leaders, the working environment would be more positive, people would be more productive, and turnover would be reduced. That's consistent with my own observation that people quit people, not companies, and the greatest cause of turnover in an organization is the lack of trust. Let me give you guys an example of trust, okay? My mother's, sorry, my wife's father used to go to church. He doesn't go to church anymore. He quit the church. This is why the pastor slept with a person in the congregation. And he was married. And that made him untrustworthy of the church. So being a good leader, and we represent the church, the church of Jesus Christ, the church where everybody's supposed to model goodness and the virtues and kindness and selflessness. So are we showing that? Are we displaying that in our everyday life? I'm trying not to get this into just about character and trying to put it with leadership because, but character is so important. You guys got to understand character is a big deal. And you know what a bigger deal is? Trust. If you go to work and you're doing all these things and you claim to be a Christian, but you're getting to work late, you're not prepared, you're wanting to leave early, you go and take 15-minute breaks in the bathroom, and those people 
Do you expect those people to trust you and want to hear about Jesus Christ? They won't believe you because your character is flawed, bad. Some of these things are just basic. These are just basic things. They're, they're not hard. These are things we should already be doing. It's very quiet tonight. Praise the Lord. Okay, page um, 64. The last um, paragraph at the bottom. Only you can decide whether to take the risk of trusting others and whether the risks are worth taking. This means to have others trust you, you must actively take initiative, some initiative. And can't wait for others to make the first move. As many leaders explained, trust is a risk game. Leaders must be the first ones to ante up. Leaders always find the ante worth risking. Sowing seeds of trust with people creates the fields of collaboration necessary to get extraordinary things done in organizations. You know, we can get a lot of people healed and set free and coming into this church if we would just show them a person they can trust. So that way when you say, hey, would you like to come to church sometime? They won't be thinking, well, you don't act like you learned anything from church. They'll actually be saying, yeah, because you're doing a great job. You're at work on time. And I just, I, you're always happy. And you look like you're full of love and you're always encouraging people. Yeah, I'd love to come to church with you. Amen? Amen. Page 65. And I thank you guys for grace tonight because this is just different, a different way of teaching for me. But by the grace of God, we're getting through it. <laughs> for years, I have taught leaders that in their interactions with others, they create accounts of trustworthiness. Every interaction with another person either makes deposits in that person's account or makes withdrawals from it. The best way to make regular ongoing deposits is by modeling good character consistently. Why? Because people are convinced more by what a leader does than by what a leader says. I'm going to go down to the next paragraph. Right underneath, in leadership, a pint of example equals a gallon of advice. In the beginning of a relationship, words hold more weight than actions because people do not know you. They may assume that your words represent who you are and that your walk matches your talk. However, as a relationship continues, your actions begin to weigh more than your words. People see what you do. Leadership confusion occurs when your words and your walk do not match. If that incongruity continues, not only will you confuse your people, you will lose your people. Mark Twain was right. Right on when he said, to do right is wonderful. To teach others to do right is even more wonderful and much easier. Easier, yes. More effective, no. At the opposite end of the spectrum, from inconsistency and broken trust is moral authority. This is the highest level of leadership. It is earned by demonstrating consistently good character and continually making deposits into trustworthiness accounts. With others, charisma may get leaders a following early on, but only credibility prompts people to keep following them. When leaders possess true moral authority, the only words they need to say are, follow me, and people join them. They know that their walk match, matches their talk and is headed in the right direction. I had a boss one time. I had many bosses when I worked construction because I always would get fired or quit. Or, I don't know, working construction was hard. Because I love to drink and do drugs. And um, I had this one boss one time. And I didn't work for him very long because when it came payday, there was always a problem with the money. We didn't get enough work done. 
to get paid so he could only give us a little bit. Or the, it was always something. It was raining that day. I don't know. He always came up with an excuse. Never paid us fully. I only worked for that guy for about a month. Finally, after a, about a month, he was able to pay me fully. So I quit. I couldn't live like that. I couldn't trust him. He was my boss and he was a liar. I did the bare minimum when I worked for him. I didn't have good character at that time anyway. But I didn't want to work for him. I didn't want to give him anything because he wasn't giving me even my pay on time on Friday. And I'm using this as an example and illustration because I want people to realize that if you don't invest in your people and you don't invest in other people and you act like you don't care and you don't talk to them and just hang out with them, they're not going to want to invest in what you're doing or stand alongside you and work. Now, let me reverse that. And I worked for this guy that was a great boss at one time. I mean great. He would come out there and he would set, as we was rolling out the cords, he would watch us. He would come out and he would talk to me. Ask me how I was doing. Ask me if there was anything I needed. I would get raises and I didn't even know it. I would look at my paycheck and I'd be like, he's paying me too much. And he said, no, I gave you a raise. Because he cared about what I thought and what I was doing for him because I was working for him. So he cared. So I was able to work hard for him. And I did. And in turn, as I was working hard for him, that helped me to get better. And then he gave me a raise. So it worked out both ways. It was like a cycle. He wasn't afraid to invest in me because he came out and actually talked to me and got to know me and knew who I was and knew how I was. And he knew I wasn't perfect because I wasn't. I mean, I was bad back then. That's why I ended up quitting for him because I missed too many days and I just didn't want to go back because I felt embarrassed because I cared for this guy that much because he was such a good guy. I just, when I missed a lot of days for some reason, I can't remember, I just didn't go back, which was one of the biggest mistakes I ever made. But this guy helped me to grow, even though I was a bad person. He helped me to grow as a person and in my abilities. And also in that time, he put me with his brother, who was kind of a big guy, but he was very, very smart when it came to doing things. I learned how to make barrel ceilings. I learned how to do a lot of things. And he actually said, because you're doing good and you show up every day and you're working, because at that time I was being very consistent because I, was, I liked what I was doing. And he put me with his brother and his brother taught me all kinds of things. But then me and his brother started going to the bar after work and it just got bad. And then after that, I missed too many days and I just quit. But that's, that's not the point of the story. That was my own foolishness. The point of the story is that he made me want to be better. And as a good leader, when you're investing in your people and talking to them and hanging out with them and just doing things that's good and helping them, that makes them trust in you and even makes them a better person. And I like doing that. I love doing that. I love helping people. I love seeing people growing now. I used to not be like that. But I just love to see people grow. It's just good. It's good to see God's people grow. And I'm just so thankful that God allows me to be a part of his people growing. Because we're his sheep, but I'm, he allows me to be part of the growing in his church. And I'm just so glad. Um, page 65 at the top. Have we already went through this? Yes. Okay. Next page. 66, um, bottom paragraph. I thought trust was nice to have. Early in my leadership journey, I didn't recognize the importance of trust. I thought it was nice to have. Who doesn't want to be trusted and given the choice? But now I understand that in leadership, trust is essential. It's not something that you can take or leave. If you leave trust, you're going to leave leadership. Trust dramatically impacts real leadership issues, such as a follower engagement, connection, buy-in, and effectiveness. 
Trust is the foundation of leadership. A strong foundation isn't a luxury. It's not just nice to have. It's crucial. Page 67. I thought trust was up to others. Some leaders, especially those who rely on their position or title to lead instead of their influence, take the posture that they should be implicit, implicitly trusted by their people. But that their people must prove themselves to be trustworthy. They put all of the burden for developing trust on others, not themselves. But developing trust is a leadership responsibility. If I want to be a good leader, it's not up to my followers. It's up to me. I must take the first step in trusting the people I lead. And I must take steps to earn their trust. Good leaders take the risk in both directions. If my people learn to trust me, I'll get their attention. But if I initiate trust in my people, I'll get their action. And the essence of successful leadership is getting things done. The essence of leadership in this church is getting people healed and set free. I thought, a, I'm down at the bottom, paragraph. I thought a single mistake automatically destroyed trust. While it's true that a single mistake can destroy trust, that is not always the case. When the trust level is already low, then that's often all it takes. However, if the trust level, next page, is high, one mistake seldom destroys what people have built in the relationship. Now, a lot of times when you meet somebody, they have, um, I hate to say pride, but they have pride. I used to have, not that I'm an expert, but I used to be really bad with pride. I remember when I went to the church in Texas, and all I could do was talk about everything that I did here. And they could care less. They wanted to know what I could do there. A lot of people have an inflated view of their self. They're puffed up. So when you talk to somebody for the first time, you don't know them and you don't know if you can trust them yet or anything. Just listen to what they say and take everything at first with a grain of salt. You know what? The best thing to do is if you're a leader and you're leading a project and you have somebody new that you don't know how they're going to do or if they want to do things is give them a small task. Something that's simple, that's just super easy that anybody can do. You know why? You want to see if they can listen to directions or not. I learned that from Pastor Dave. You want to know if they can listen to directions. If they can't do that small, simple task, how will they do something big that you give them? They won't. More than likely. Because small things should be super easy to do. And they should do it and say, well, this ain't nothing. I'm going to get this done. But, and then you put them in charge of a big thing and they don't do it. Or they don't follow through. That's bad. That's bad. That's being a bad leader. And it is hard to gain trust. Because I told Pastor Dave when I first started working on his house. I said, oh yeah, I'm an expert carpenter. We'll get it done in a couple weeks. That was my famous line when I'm doing something. Take a couple days, a couple weeks. Became a joke for after a while. But I was not that good. I, I was good, but here's my problem. I would not, I was so used to doing things fast and rough and just slopping it and throwing it together. That's what I did on his house. And I remember that one day when he said, did you use a plumb bob on that stairs? I said, what's a plumb bob? <laughs> um, a plumb bob, it's just a thing that hangs from a string that makes everything straight all the way down. I was like, I didn't even know what one was. I just always use a level. So I just leveled each level. Each level of the house, I would just level it and not actually straighten it straight down. Because a level, you know, a four-foot level doesn't level very long. And he had to fix it. I'm sure my ears was probably burning at the time. And I'm sure there was more than just that he had to fix in the house. 
But thank God we got it done. <laughs> but see, that's the thing. A lot of people will have an inflated view of their self, and they think they can do all this stuff, and sometimes they might not even realize it. I didn't realize that I was that bad until I started watching Pastor Dave and talking to him, and he said, just slow down. And I slowed down because there's a certain pace that everybody works at well. Some people work a little slower. Some people can work a little faster. But if you get a person that needs to just think a little bit longer because that's the way they work, and you just try to crack the whip and say, come on, let's go, let's go, you're going to end up spending more time going back and fixing the things they messed up instead of just letting them take their time and do it right. I've learned that with myself. Some things, man, I can just get in there and I can just go, go, go. Other things, I slow down and take my time because I'm not as familiar with the process. And I don't want to miss a step in construction. You can, if you miss a step, you got to go back and tear stuff out sometimes. So it just, it's a process and it takes time. So it, being leaders, we have to just realize that certain people, we have to give them a little more grace or they have to just work a little slower as long as they're getting it done. As long as they're getting it done. As long as they're faithful in what they're doing. If they're ever smoking a cigarette or something, as a Christian, you shouldn't be smoking a cigarette anyway. But if they're ever smoking a cigarette and just slacking and, oh, I'll get it done in a little bit, that's bad. But if they're over there diligently working all day and that's just the pace they work at, so be it. They're getting stuff done. Everybody works at a different pace. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to go there. Pastor Dave's eyes was burning a hole through my head. No, just kidding. I love you. I'm just joking. <laughs> okay. Page 68, middle paragraph, right? Everybody with me? Okay. So much of leadership relies on good character. Trust is created through it. Talent is protected by it. Internal peace is fostered by it. People cannot climb beyond the limitations of their character. Leaders cannot succeed beyond the depth of their character. Good leaders have the potential to be difference makers, and character makes a difference for them and protects them. Good leaders are often a gift to the world, and character protects that gift. Number two, successful leaders embrace the four dimensions of character. In this book, Derailed, Tim Irwin wrote that there are four dimensions to character. Authenticity, self-management, humility, and courage. I agree with this perspective and want to use those four dimensions as my framework for describing the process of character building. So let's look at each one of them, starting with authenticity. Authenticity. I've observed that a lot of leaders have a difficult time with authenticity. Many don't want to let down their guard. They may feel that they are in a no-win situation. They worry that if they reveal their failures, they'll lose credibility. Yet if they try to hide their failures, they come across as phony. If they hide their success, they fear they won't have as much credibility. But if they highlight only their success... They come across as arrogant and unrelatable. How does a leader navigate the situation? That's a very, very good question. Here's the answer. Um, second paragraph right below, um, there are four dimensions to character. Most of the, on page 69, most of the time we live between those two lines. When people see us on the success line, we have to be careful not to think that it is who we really are. We can be like the athlete who wins a gold medal or a Super Bowl and starts to believe he's spectacular all the time at everything he does. It's not reality. People may try to put such individuals on a pedestal, but they will surely fall off. That's why the Bible says don't put a novice in a place of leadership. Because their character is not developed enough yet. They haven't went through hellfire. They'll, they'll think they know everything, especially with young people. So if a young people's person's out there and they're listening to this right now, and they're like, that's not me, that is you. Character has to be worked in. Character has to be worked in. 
if you don't have kids and you want to be a leader and you're going to have kids and a family when you get older, I'm telling you, ask anybody that has a family and is doing leadership or working in ministry. It's tough. When we had the kids and we did the bus ministry and people that worked with us like Dave and Chrissy and Tom and Marty. Sorry, I said that on the camera. But anyway, it was hard, wasn't it, guys? It's not easy. We was the first ones to church. We would have meetings and talk about bus routes for kids. We had to have buses and vehicles to get the kids to church. And then also take care of our own families. All of us have our families. and we, Our kids was all in high school at that time. Wrestling, track practice, all this. Pastor Dave really had it rough, man, because he had six kids. And they was in sports. It's rough. But by the grace of God, you can do it. Don't think that you have to stay and go to every one of your kids' meets. I'm not telling you what to do. Don't think you have to go to every one of their practices. Because if you want to be able to do ministry and do other things with your kids, you can't do both at one time. A lot of times they would have meets or a, something on a Wednesday night. We had, we had to be here to do the children's ministry. I just couldn't go that night. But you know what? Every other time I got a chance to, I was faithful in going and making sure they knew that I loved them. And even though we was working with all these kids and doing all that stuff with all these other kids, I always took the time to tell them, you know we love you, but you know that these kids don't get love and they don't have the same kind of family that you have. So just share mom and dad with these other kids because they need help too. I always made sure my kids knew that. I always made sure that they knew that they was loved and we wasn't leaving them out. We included them. That's very important when you're doing ministry with kids. I'm just going off the leadership thing right now and saying this to everybody in here. It's very important that your kids remember, even though, especially in children's ministry, if you're working with other kids, just make sure that your kids know that you love them and that you're there for them. That's very important. Very important. Okay. There are also times when we travel, it's going back to the middle of the, um, 69. There are also times when we travel along the failure line. We all make mistakes. We all make bad choices. And we all fall short. If we believe that's who we are, we won't want to get out of bed. Let me, I just want to read that again. If we believe that that's who we are, we won't want to get out of bed. We shouldn't buy into that either. Both lines of success or fail and or of failure are extremes. We're neither as good nor as bad as they might indicate. Authenticity is about living an open life between those lines. In my early years, I only wanted to tell others about my experiences on the success line. I wanted to impress people. As I grow older, I feel an opposite pull to share my failures so that I can encourage people. Because I'm a public figure, people often only see me at my best, not my worst. For that reason, some people give me more credit than I deserve. That bothers me. Yes, I can understand. Instead of wanting to point to my breakthroughs, I want to direct people to the brokenness that has held to my breakthroughs. Next page, page 70. None of us is flawless. Good people do bad things. Smart people do dumb things. We all find ourselves in moments when we feel tempted to do something we know in our hearts isn't the right thing. And we've all veered off course. It's humbling sharing that with others. And it's authentic. Page 71, um, middle of the book. Character is not about intelligence. It's about making right choices. And then halfway down, on a highway, this, I'm going to tell you about this. I'm going to go back up here to this. Character is not about intelligence. It's about making right choices. Now, this is the example. On a highway, guardrails keep cars from going over a cliff. With them in place, you may crash, but you likely won't die. When it comes to character, I believe the best guardrails are the decisions that you make before you face high-pressure situations. It's easier to manage yourself 
if you've already made a tough decision, the tough decisions related to your values. It's impossible to maintain good character when you don't know what you value. When I was out here on the program at the church, and Pastor Dave's always been my mentor and my father in the Lord, and he always will be. But when I was out here that time, I would always go to him about questions I had in the Bible, especially early on. Okay? And I would ask him what he thought. I came to this one scripture, and I'm not going to say it because everybody needs to do their own, own stuff when it comes to the Word of God. But I was um, stuck on this one scripture because I just couldn't quite understand, and I was just having troubles and struggling with it. And I didn't know which way I should be when it came to this scripture. On which side of the, it's, it seems like on the, at this scripture, in this junction, I could go either way, and either way wouldn't necessarily be wrong. So I took that to Pastor Dave and I asked him what he thought. And he said, there's some things in the Bible that you have to stop and ask the Holy Spirit to tell you and to search your heart and find out what you believe about it. Not everybody can tell you what to believe about the Bible. That's between you and the Holy Spirit and God. There's certain things at our church, though, that you need to believe to be in leadership here. But there's certain things in the Bible that's just, it's not black and white. So you have to decide where you're at. That's with the Bible. That's when it comes to, when you're in leadership and you're doing this in church, you have to know where you stand at these junctions. You can't just read over it and say, I'll get back to that later. You need to come to a decision of what you think and what you believe about what the word says. Every part of the word. You need to know where you stand. So when somebody comes to you or something happens, you're solid in what you say. You're sound. You know exactly what it says and what it means to you. Amen? Okay. Um, I'm going to go ahead and read this. Um, at the bottom of page 70, author and speaker Ruth Hanley Barton says, we set young leaders up for a fall if we encourage them to envision what they can do before they consider the kind of person they should be. What she's speaking about is the strengthening of character that comes from good self-management. And young people, when you go through those things, you'll just, it'll just grow. It'll help you to grow. I'm telling you, do not pray yourself out of a situation if you know it's God's testing you. Because you can pray yourself out of a situation. You stay in that situation. You go through to the end. You let God develop that character in you. Everybody. We're all, st we're all growing. Don't pray yourself out of that. Just go ahead and go through it. It hurts sometimes. I'm telling you. I've been through some things. And I just feel like my heart's been ripped out. And I don't know why. And I don't understand. But at the end I look back and I'm like. Oh that's why. But at the time. I don't understand. There's been many times like that in my life. There's been times when I'm just angry and frustrated and I don't know why. And I'm like, God, why is this happening? Why are you doing this to me? And he's working on my character. After it's all said and done, if I stick in there and don't quit, when I, at the, when I get to the end of it and I look back, I'm like, that wasn't that bad. But it was when I was going through it. And then it's just, it's a continuing cycle. God wants us to be better. God wants us to have better character. This is going to happen all of our lives. I don't care if you're 85 or 15. It's just going to happen. Because God cares more about our character than the gifts. Your character's what people see. The gifts they see as well. But God gives those to us. So like Pastor Dave always says, he made a donkey talk. Talk. Not just think and do something smart. Actually talk. What if your dog could talk to you? You say, man, you are dumb. No. Because <laughs> sometimes I, throw, I do stuff and my dog's sitting there looking at me. And I'm like, I know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, page 72. <laughs> Humility. Nobody likes working with leaders who are full of themselves and work only for their own benefit. People want to work with a leader who displays humility. 
Skip down to the very last um, sentence in, the, in that paragraph. I love that, yes, we are flawed, and yes, we make mistakes, and yes, we are human, but that's okay. That's okay. Very bottom of the page. Dale Carnegie said, if you tell me how to get your feeling of importance, I'll tell you what you are. How you get your feeling of importance, I'll tell you what you are. Where and how we seek validation impacts character. As a young man, I wanted to make a big splash. That's what was important to me. In the beginning, it was, excuse me, in the beginning, it was all about me, my goals, my success. Slowly, I realized that I was not on earth to see how important I could become, but to see how much of a difference I could make in the lives of others. Artist John Ruskin asserted, I believe that the first test of a truly great man is his humility. I don't mean by humility um, doubt of his power, but really great men have a curious feeling that the greatness is not of them, but through them. The greatness is not of them, a feeling, but it's through them. For most people, humility has to be earned. It is developed over time as you accept your weaknesses and give grace to others for theirs. In college, I read these words written by Thomas A. Kempis. Be not angry that you cannot make others as you wish them to be, since you cannot make yourself as you wish to be. Ain't that true? So many times we say stuff about other people and we're doing the same thing. That made a strong impression on me because at the time, I did, I did want to change others. I had to learn how to focus on changing and improving myself. That happens only when you acknowledge that your flaws are great enough that they need to be addressed. That requires and creates humility. And when you begin to develop humility... You are in a better position to serve the people that you lead. How did Jesus serve? How did Jesus lead? Jesus led with compassion and humility. And he was one of the greatest leaders in the world. And he led with compassion and humility. He washed the stubborn disciples' feet. That's humility. And didn't say, oh, look what I'm doing. No. I just, oh, man, I can't wait to see Jesus. <laughs> oh, thank you, Lord. Next page. 74, courage. All right, thank you, Lord. Courage makes character possible. It empowers us to do what's right in the face of fear, fatigue, or uncertainty. Character is not developed in ease and quiet. Only through experience and trial and suffering can the soul be strengthened. There are times in every leader's life when he feels obligated to take people where he himself has not yet gone. To talk farther than he has walked. I'm sorry, to talk farther than he has walked. I know that has been true of me. At such times, I do not feel Competent enough, experienced enough, strong enough, faithful enough, wise enough, or qualified enough. At those times, I must acknowledge my weakness, ask for God. That's key. Ask for God and others to help me. And summon the courage to take action. That's very important. If, if you don't know what to do or where to go, I would consider you have those people that you can trust. You have those friends in your life that you can trust. Those certain people that you can turn to in a situation. If you're having troubles, don't just go into it blind. Pray. Ask God to show you who you need to go to. Or ask God to lead you and direct you and guide you in what you need to do. You don't need to go out and blab it to everybody. Because then if it goes a different way, you're going to look bad. You're gonna, they're going to think you heard from God. And then next thing you know, you're doing something different. And they're like, I thought you heard from God. So when you get in a situation like that, you need to pray. And then after you've prayed, 
pray some more. And then after you've prayed some more, pray a little bit more. Before you ever say anything, know the direction God wants you to go. And then you don't reveal it all at once because God might change it on the way. You just reveal a little bit of it at a time. A piece here and a piece there because that's how God leads us. It's not (laughs) a big, long, quick run. I'm sorry. It's not a quick run. It's a long, drawn-out run. God's only going to give you pieces as you go. Because if he gives you too much, when you get to the spot where you need it, you're going to have too much, and you're not going to be able to use it all. But if he gives you a piece at a time as you go, you're going to be able to use that piece as you go. And also, we walk by faith, not by sight. What pleases God? Faith. So he's not going to give it to you all at once. If he did, you wouldn't have to live in faith. Amen? Amen. All right. Let's see here. Never be afraid to admit that you are wrong. Never, ever be afraid to admit that you are wrong. And pray that people will give you grace. And they should. It should work both ways. If you're showing that in the church and you're, you're functioning that in your church, then it'll work. Character makes you bigger on the inside, at the bottom of page 74. Character makes you bigger on the inside than on the outside. I'm not going to say that name. An ancient Greek philosopher said, What we achieve inwardly will change um, outer reality. That has always been true. Character is built on the inside before it shows up on the outside. Bottom of page 75. The inner voice. It wants to make you bigger on the inside. The outer voice wants to make you bigger on the outside. The voice you listen to wins the battle. When your inner voice says, I have done wrong, you have a chance to deal with the feelings of character, incongruence, or hypocrisy by making changes. That allows you to regain your character equilibrium. 76. The outer, at the top, the outer voice encourages you to appear bigger on the outside, often at the expense of who you are on the inside. It creates a cognitive dissonance and unhealthy hypocrisy that outer voice might say something like, what I say and what I do are not the same and never will be. That's the way it is. Just keep up appearances. That's not a good road for anyone to go down. It's especially bad for leaders because they can become inauthentic, rationalizing, and unteachable. It's very bad to be a leader and be unteachable. That's, that's bad, especially when it comes to the Bible and comes to God. To develop character and become bigger on the inside than the outside, I must deal with my weaknesses. I must embrace failure And learn from it. I must choose the better path forward. And you must choose as well. The better path forward. Going down to the bottom last paragraph. The result of developing strong character. On the inside is self respect. Which comes not from accomplishments or achievements. But from making the right choices. Brooks wrote. It is earned. By being better than you used to be. By being dependable in times of testing. That's very important to be dependable in times of testing. Straight in times of temptation. That means you're still doing what the Bible says to do when you're tempted. And it emerges in one who is morally dependable. Self-respect is produced by inner triumphs, not external ones. Page 77, very bottom of that paragraph. If you focus on the outside, you will neglect the inside. However, if you focus on the inside, the outside will always benefit. Page 78. Thank you, Lord. Recently, I read an article about 
Theo Epstein, the president of baseball operations for the Chicago Cubs. People have begun recognizing him because in 2016, the Cubs finally won the World Series. Something that hadn't happened since 1908. He had worked for several teams, including the Boston Red Sox, before going to Chicago. But by the time he got there, he'd learned the importance of character. I used to scoff at it when I first took the job in Boston, Epstein said, referring to a focus on character. I just felt like, you know how we're going to win. By getting guys who get on base more than the other team. And by getting pitchers who miss bats and get ground balls. Talent wins, but... It's likely every year I did the job, I just developed a greater appreciation for how much the human element matters and how much more you can achieve as a team. When you play players who care about winning and care about each other, they develop those relationships, have those conversations, and it creates an environment where the sum is greater than the parts. That's how church should be. Epstein was hired as the Cubs president in October 2011. In January 2012, he met with all the organization's managers, coaches, trainers, and operations personnel. They spent one day talking about hitting, and one on pitching, one on defense and base running, and the other, and the one on character. Those became the foundation to achieve the one goal Epstein had for the organization win a world championship. In his fifth season with a young team, Epstein was on the cusp of achieving that goal. Sports Illustrated writer Tom Verducci said the defining moment occurred during a rain delay following the ninth inning of Game 7 of the World Series. After the Indians had come back to tie the game, the young Cubs team didn't crack. They didn't shrink. They didn't stumble. What they did do, the players called a meeting, Verdici wrote, the Cubs packed shoulder to shoulder for a players only meeting in a small weight room behind the visiting dugout at Progressive Field. He called it a strong visual of Epstein's ideals of collaboration and character. In the top of the 10th, the Cubs scored two runs. It was enough to win the game by a score of 8-7. to seven. The Cubs' character had carried them through when they needed it. And that's what we should do. That's what we should all work for. Whether we're team members or leaders of the team, character always counts. I want to say this. This up here we call... The judgment free zone. That means when somebody comes in here. If they're not saved. Or they're hurting. Or they need prayer or anything. They can come up here. Without eyes of judgment on them. But I want to take that a step further tonight. I want to say. That. All of us. That's in this body of Christ now. That's saved forgiven and set free. Need to continue. To give each other. That same grace and respect too many times as Christians because we have other Christians we're like they should know better no all of us have bad days not all of us none of us is perfect and we should all be able to forgive and be okay with it and if somebody offends you just let it roll off maybe they're having a bad day have not all of us not had a bad day Have all of us at times just want to be left alone. And maybe somebody's at church and you come in and you're feeling down and drug out. And they just want to encourage you but you take it wrong because you're mad and upset. We've got to love each other. If we can't love each other, when people come in here, what are they going to see? Sure, we give grace to the sinners. We understand that. But what about each other? This is important. You know what? We have to work with each other because we need a spirit of unity because the Holy Spirit's not going to move if there's not. And how many of us want the Holy Spirit moving like he was tonight? So let's just lay down our differences. 
Let's lay down the pride and the arrogance and let's work together as a team. You know what? If in war and in the army, some people can really understand this and relate. It's not just Rambo out there blasting people with that big gun. What's that big gun called that he always uses? What is it? M60. That's not going to win the war. Not one guy out there with a gun. It's not I. There is no I in this church. It's all of us working together corporately with a common goal to see people healed, to peep, see people set free, to see the lost sick, to see recovery of the blind. We need to see that and we want that. So let's all work together towards that common goal. Let's be all in. Let's just not be a little bit. Let's be all in. Together. Nobody's better than the other person. That's not the way God sees it. That's not the way Jesus sees it or said it. He put himself, had all the gifts, working mighty miracles. There was not enough books that could be written by all the things he did. But yet he washed his disciples' feet to show humility. Together in this church, if we would all just work together and all have that same common goal and vision in our heart and in our mind, we could get so much more accomplished and done for the kingdom of God. That's what God wants. That's what God wants. If Rambo's up here shooting the gun, he's going to get blasted and there ain't going to be nobody else to come help. <laughs> but yet, if we communicate and we say, okay, I need a team to go over here and I need a team to go over there. And we communicate, we're going to win the battle. But if we just all clam up by ourselves and don't say nothing at all, we're not going to get nothing done. we got to communicate. Being good leaders is communicating. Communicate with each other. Amen? Amen. Go up to somebody. Oh, hey, can you go with me to pray for this person? Because I know that you was healed of that. And I know this person over here needs a healing. Will you come with me and go with me and pray for this person? If God puts it on your heart and you need somebody that needs prayed for and you don't want to just go do it by yourself, grab somebody. There's nothing wrong with that. If you haven't did it that much and you feel like you need to go pray, go grab somebody to go pray with you. That's not a big deal. The big deal is seeing that person healed. Not worrying about your pride. Amen? I just want to see our church grow. Father God, I just want to thank you for tonight. I just want to thank you for this series. Father God, I'm learning so much and I know these people are too. I just pray, Father God, that as we continue this series, that you just continue to fill us with the knowledge of what a good leader is and that you help us to implement these leadership skills into our life in the areas where we can use it and where we can see it at, Father God, where it can work at and the level it can work at, Father God. I thank you for helping us to do this and I thank you for helping us come up as a church, that we're coming up, Father God. And I thank you so much for it. I give you all the glory and all the praise. To your son be all the glory. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said...